Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our simulation webinar. I hope you're well, and I'm only sorry that in this strange world we can't offer you snacks or perhaps the ability to simulate donuts and coffee, but we will persist. Today we'll explore the topic of integrating simulation into wildfire aviation training where we will gain an insight into the work being conducted by our friends in Alberta, Canada. My name's Josephine Sterling. I'm the business manager at the National Aerial Firefighting Centre and I'm delighted to be your host. May I start by acknowledging that I host this event from North Melbourne on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all join us today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in the event. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters across Australia. I'll introduce our speakers shortly, but before I do just some brief housekeeping notes. Firstly, today's event will be recorded and made available afterwards along with presentation slides. Today we'll be using the Q&A feature on Zoom to take our questions. So please post your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat window. In the Q&A box, you can upvote questions by clicking the thumbs up button. And I'll do my best to ask, to ask a number of these questions to our speakers following their presentation. I encourage you to use the chat window to share any thoughts or reflections during the presentations. Just a reminder that you will need to select from the drop down box, all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to view those messages. And I encourage your questions. I would also like to remind you to please be respectful when to each other when you're, when you're posting your questions. So please join me in welcoming our speakers for today, speaking all the way from Canada, where it is now their evening. We can enjoy their presentations and also their delightful accents. Our first speaker will be Nicole Gallambos, Director of Training for the Government of Alberta's Forestry Division. Nicole has been working in wildfire management professional since 2005 and has worked in forest fire science, planning and strategy development. Currently, as the Director of Aviation Training for the Government of Alberta's Forestry Division, Nicole oversees the wildfire management branch training program, including the aerial firefighting training simulated development. A practicing fire behavior analyst and co-chair of the division's diversity and inclusion working group, Nicole's passions include any and all things relating to firefighter safety, staff development, and the study of fire behavior. Secondly, we'll hear from Scott Elliott, senior wildfire management training specialist at the Hinton Training Center in Alberta. Scott has been involved in wildfire management operations for 30 years and is currently certified as a type one incident commander. And thirdly, Greg Boyachak, provincial air tanker program supervisor. Greg has been involved in wildfire management for over 27 years, has been an air attack officer for 20 and the provincial air tanker program supervisor for eight. Part of Greg's responsibilities include air attack officer recruiting and training. So over to you, Nicole, and then Scott and Greg. Thank you very much, Josephine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, really happy to be able to be here today virtually, uh, talking with you about the success we've had integrating simulations into our aerial wildfire training program. Uh, so with Scott and Greg's assistance, we're gonna run through an overview uh, presentation and slide deck for you, turn it over to play a video demonstration and save some time at the end for uh, questions and answers. If we can move to the next slide. Perfect, thanks. Uh, today we're gonna talk about um, how we manage wildfires in Alberta, the role of the Hinton Training Center. We're gonna walk through some of our experience designing and developing an aerial simulator and the associated training for that simulator. And along the way, we're gonna to highlight to you uh, the value of simulation training, some lessons we've learned, uh, including some challenges and where we see the future uh, use and, and simulation program going. Uh, next slide, please. I don't see the next slide, but um, maybe it's progressed on your end. Perfect. 
so in Canada, each province or territory has a responsibility for wildfire response, uh, including the training and certification of all of our aerial and ground suppression personnel. Alberta, highlighted in the map of North America there, is uh, in Western Canada. And our forest protection area, uh, my video screen is covering the map, but maybe it's showing up for some of you, um, is about 80 million hectares of uh, forested land uh, where the government of Alberta has exclusive responsibility for wildfire suppression and response. Uh, when it comes to our, our fire environment, on average, we see about 1,600 wildfires and 400,000 hectares burned uh, each year. And as you all know, that, that number is very, uh, is very variable depending on the severity of the fire season. We do have an aerial focused approach to wildfire management in Alberta. On any given day, we can have seven air tanker groups uh, with multiple aircraft in each group and up to 200 or more rotary wing or helicopters on hire uh, throughout the province. And when we get into a large fire or a contentious fire, uh, we can have significant numbers of aircraft. Um, an example might be the Fort McMurray fire in 2016, where on the one incident we had over 90 rotary wing assigned to that fire. To round things out on the staffing front, we have about 450 permanent staff, 750 or more seasonal staff join us every fire season in addition to hundreds of contractors that we can call on during periods of escalated fire activity. Next slide, please. So I mentioned previously that each province has a responsibility to train and certify their staff. In Alberta, we've taken a centralized training approach uh, where we do train all permanent and seasonal staff out of our facility in Hinton. The Hinton Training Center is essentially uh, an old college uh, with typical uh, dormitory style rooms uh, that can accommodate 200 folks a night, a commercial kitchen that can feed up to 250 people. Uh, and in addition to myself, we have seven full-time training specialists, wildfire training specialists, and two online learning staff that lead our wildfire training program for the province. We have 50 or more training uh, courses, workshops, and various simulation events uh, that we put on every year. And our target audience is everybody from our, our first year crew members, uh, seasonal dispatchers, um, through to you know, uh, veteran fire staff that are progressing into type one incident management team roles or technical specialists, uh, such as our air attack officer program. Because we do have the, uh, the physical space here, our aerial wildfire training simulator is located at the Hinton Training Center. Uh, it works out well because we have the capacity to have various role player and uh, main cockpit uh, facilities. And we are about three hours from Edmonton where our provincial aviation program staff and aviation specialists work. So that's a little bit of the history of um, uh, the center, what we do here, how we train uh, people in Alberta. And I'll now turn things over to Scott to start to dive into the details of our simulator on site. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, uh, or good afternoon, I guess. Um, so uh, real pleased to, to be here to, to talk with you all about uh, <clears throat> some of the programs that we put in place here. Um, well, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg to sort of talk about how we use the, the simulator, but uh, if we flip over to the next slide, um, what I'll try and do is sort of uh, give you sort of a, a broad overview of the, of the system that we put in place. Um, sort of what the, the, the physical components and the software components are that we're utilizing uh, to develop the, the, the simulator program that uh, Greg's going to talk about at the utilization here. Um, so like you can see, we've been working on this for approximately five years, but it might be a little bit over five years. Um, when we started the, the, the project, uh, it became pretty apparent right away that there was no sort of real commercially available off the shelf solution to the, the problems that we were, we were trying to solve there. So um, development and uh, sort of 
training operations happened about at the same time. So as we were developing the thing, um, we were also trying to utilize it operationally uh, to, to make sure that we were heading down the right road and, and making sure that it was going to serve the purpose that we, that we wanted to have there. Um, over the years, uh, with lots of uh, specialized contractor support and, and, and other support out there, we've been able to develop a, what's a, a pretty sophisticated and robust system for what turns out to be a fairly reasonable price. Um, and in 2019, uh, the other provinces across Canada started to uh, get a sense of what it was we were doing. And so um, we we're sharing that information across all the other agencies to, uh, to create sort of a compatible simulation system. Um, so our system essentially consists of a simplified main cockpit there. And that's what's uh, uh, sort of in the top right hand portion of this slide here. Um, and essentially just, it consists of simplify, simplified flight controls because we're not really training pilots. We're interested in training the, the, the the firefighter who sits beside the pilot there. So our air attack officers primarily as, as the tactical firefighter in the air. Um, and so our simplified flight controls consist of like gamer quality uh, and kind of reasonably inexpensive gamer quality uh, yoke and throttle quadrant and rudder pedals. Um, also inside that, that simplified main cockpit, it's generally configured to be a fixed wing aircraft, but we can uh, make some real simple modifications to also simulate a helicopter as well. And we just sort of use a, a gamer joystick for, for controlling the, the, the flight in, inside the cockpit for a helicopter. Uh, we've also developed a director station that we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, networked role player stations because um, you need to have that interaction uh, to create the, the realistic simulator environment that we're looking for. Um, the network capability is something we'll, we'll talk about a fair bit here. And because the the, the flight platform that we use is, is the Lockheed Martin prepared uh, platform, also known as P3D. Um, it is fully networked and that allows uh, role players and participants from, uh, well, essentially anywhere in the world, so long as they're on that same network, uh, to be able to participate in our training. So the, the network capability was something that we identified early in the project uh, that we wanted to make sure that we had the, uh, was, was part of the, the build that we were looking for. Um, and then, there's also a communication system that we'll talk uh, about to, for the, uh, the communication system that we've developed and had developed for us uh, is integral to the, the simulation project or the simulations exercises that we uh, utilize. Um, the key software that we've got right now is the Lockheed Martin P3D, like I mentioned, and a, a, a purpose-built add-on software to P3D called Lorby Wildfire Response. And we'll flip over to the next slide, please. Um, so this is essentially a couple of shots of the, um, the Lorby wildfire response software. Uh, so it creates a director station that allows um, the, the director or the, the leader of the, of the simulation exercise to, to place fires and then modify the, um, the, the configuration of the exercise. The uh, wind speed and direction can change. We can add new fires. We can add spot fires. We can, we can sort of uh, manipulate the, the scenario to meet the, the learning objectives of the, of the trainee or the participant that's, that's going through there. So from this station, the, the, the simulation director can, can monitor the simulation and, and then modify the, the exercise as required. Um, and like I, like I mentioned, it's all kind of fully networked uh, that, that allows um, our ability to integrate other participants or, or, uh, or role players into the simulation uh, as required. Um, let's see, one of the other things I wanted to talk about, uh, oh, was the, uh, the fire modeling that goes into there. Uh, so in Lorby Wildfire Response, the, the fire growth is, is dynamic. So it does respond to uh, changes in wind direction and wind speed and kind of a, a real, uh, benefit that we got out of the development of this software is it also responds to the uh, suppression action that the participant in the simulation undertakes. So uh, when, they, when they direct tanker action or air tanker action onto a portion of the fire, the fire does respond to that suppression action as well, uh, which is uh, really beneficial to the, uh, or it's a nice advancement in the simulation program that we got. Uh, yeah, let's flip over to the next slide, please.
embedded in the Lorby wildfire response software is the Lorby Calm software. And that in, in my mind, it was sort of the game changer that the software provided uh, to create a real immersive environment that allowed us to uh, essentially use a VoIP protocol. So it's, it's VoIP software um, that allows us discrete and distinct uh, multi-channel capabilities for the trainee or participant in the simulation to, to undertake. Um, so they have access to four distinct uh, radio channels that, that is access push to talk, uh, as well as a voice activated intercom. And the development of, of that chunk of the software uh, really created the ability for us to mimic the, the communication systems that our air attack officers utilize inside the, the actual aircraft. Uh, and the, the stack of radios that you see on the, the right hand side of this slide uh, is is the screenshot of the software that we utilize, but it would be exactly analogous to uh, the same setup that our air attack officers have inside their aircraft. And that was uh, uh, really beneficial to again, create that immersive environment that we were looking for. A couple of other things that we've integrated into the, the simplified cockpit is uh, the GPS, GPS software um, that again, mimics the, the functionality of, of the uh, GPS that is embedded in many of our aircraft, uh, as well as um, it has the real functionality, and I, I'll put air quotes around the word real, uh, but the GPS is functional in the simulation world as well. So you can use that to navigate to and from your, your, uh, your waypoints, uh, as well as a siren was integrated in there. And that is part of the sort of the, the procedures and processes that we're trying to uh, incur, like, uh, I guess, allow our air attack officers to practice. Uh, and so as much sort of real world functionalities we can integrate into our simulated cockpit, that's, that's kind of really what we're after. Um, and I guess with that, I will turn it over to Greg uh, to sort of talk about how we are using the simulator uh, to develop staff. All right, uh, thanks Scott. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so we have, um, while we, we pretty much developed this uh, initially to train air attack officers, especially new air attack officers, we've kind of, uh, since the development branched out and found, I guess, certainly some other uses for it. So on, uh, on an average year, we'll probably run 30 to 40 personnel uh, through the simulator. Uh, we'll do anywhere between 80 and 100 simulations, uh, probably equals you know, 120 to 140 hours of, uh, of simulation work. Um, so in, in the bulk of that is uh, our fire season in, in Alberta is generally sort of April till end of September. So, and with the, probably the busiest normally is kind of May and June. So, so the, the majority of our training gets done in March and April, sort of the springtime here for uh, leading into the fire season. So um, we do uh, air attack officer. I currently have 24 air attack officers that uh, work for me. Uh, so every one of them does uh, proficiency rides or check rides, we call them. Uh, usually they'll get three to four simulations starting from very basic at the rest off simulations to, uh, to much more advanced simulations. Uh, we have a helicopter coordinator program uh, and course that we've uh, uh, developed here as well. So um, we uh, typically will do some simulations for uh, as part of that uh, course. And then I have, uh, you know, two to three trainees, air attack officer trainees per year. Um, that we'll do anywhere between uh, probably four to 10 simulations for them um, over, over the period of two years. Um, and then we also do a national air attack uh, training program uh, in Hinton, usually every couple of years, and we'll do some simulation, uh, basic simulation work uh, for, for those trainees. And then we've also uh, in the past done uh, some crew leader uh, simulation work. Uh, our rappel uh, spotters did simulation work for several years. Um, so we kind of use that for um, 
for a bunch of different rules and purposes. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide. Okay, thank you. Okay, so when we when we set up our simulations, we usually uh, obviously this is before COVID. Uh, that certainly threw some wrenches into our plans last spring. But um, on a typical year, we'll um, we usually do small groups, uh, normally about eight eight per group uh, when we do the simulations. So in that group, we'll have a group leader. Uh, that leader's responsibilities are basically keeping everyone on time and on track, but probably more importantly, uh, determining what the goals of each simulation will be uh, based on the trainees' needs. Uh, so they'll they'll basically be in charge of uh, kind of the the briefings and debriefings. Uh, quite often, they'll also be a, a trainer or a check writer at the same time. Uh, and then uh, Scott mentioned we have a simulator uh, director station or simulation director station. So <clears throat> there'll be a, a director in place that, you know, their responsibility is basically to set up the simulation, um, making sure that uh, the fire that uh, or fires that we're uh, simulating are appropriate for whatever goals we want to achieve. Uh, making sure that all the uh, role players are in the correct positions on the correct radio channels, that type of thing. Uh, and then any sort of troubleshooting um, uh, things that come along. So, and then we'll have multiple role players. And uh, we, while I do have a couple uh, of my air attac officers are pilots as well, uh, the vast majority of us aren't. So <clears throat> we've basically learned uh, to fly in the sim world, uh, both helicopters, air tankers, that type of thing. Um, so for the most part, although we do get occasionally uh, some, uh, some of our air tanker and bird dog pilots in to work with us, uh, for the most part, we do uh, the role playing ourselves and, and all the flying ourselves um, amongst the air attack group. So, uh, and then there'll be a trainer and trainee, um, you know, within that group as well. So based on the trainees, uh, I guess the training goals, um, you know, it could be everything from you know, maybe working a, a fire in topography could be a training goal. So we would, uh, we have a, a list of simulations, kind of our menu, I guess, that uh, we can uh, position fires wherever we want and have certain role players based on uh, um, those training goals. Uh, we start every um, simulation off with a role player briefing. So that's usually done by the group leader. Uh, we'll brief the role players on what the goals of the simulation are, uh, what the complexity level is going to be, that type of thing. Uh, and then that's followed by a trainee briefing. So it's usually just a, a smaller one-on-one -on -one briefing with uh, either the leader or check rider uh, with the trainee as to where they were, where they're positioned, uh, you know, what kind of uh, weather they're expecting that day, uh, fire behavior, that type of thing. Uh, and then we jump into the simulation. And um, when we, most of our simulations take about an hour and a half uh, uh, especially the air attack ones, uh, we, we try to do them in real time as much as we can. Um, there is the odd thing we, we may speed up, but for the most part, we do them in real time. Um, and then one of the things we do with our either a check rider or a trainer who's in the back seat of the main cockpit, uh, they're able to observe the, uh, the trainee and the, say, bird dog pilot uh, interacting, uh, they'll be able to listen to, in on all the audio. And what we do is they have a, a group text set up with the role players in the back room. So basically we can have interactive uh, inputs from, from that uh, trainer. So if he wants to, uh, you know, simplify things or add another air tanker into the mix or uh, make uh, the scenario more complex or whatever, he just has to text. Uh, the back room or the role player room, and they'll um, add that instantly into the scenario. So it makes it very realistic and uh, and um, and lifelike. So then we always follow um, every simulation with a debrief afterwards. Uh, usually, as a whole group, we'll uh, debrief with the trainee, and then occasionally we'll do one on one with just the trainer and the trainee um, as well, depending, uh, especially if they're a newer uh, um, air attack officer or help. 
And then we always log our simulations just so we can uh, keep track of how much simulation time we're doing and, uh, and uh, you know, kind of what works and what doesn't for us. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, obviously there's a, there's a lot of value to simulator training uh, besides cost savings, but um, one of the big ones that we have uh, to train one air attack officer in Alberta currently uh, takes two years, like two full fire seasons, um, and costs about $75,000. And that's just in flight time and fuel. Um, prior prior to simulation, uh, so that's uh, to to train just one air attack officer. So the cost for for training them are substantial, and uh, and then also the uh, I guess the the washout rate or the scrub rate uh, for the trainees is fairly high, probably about sixty percent of um, of the trainees who try to get into the air attack program, um, you know, won't make it. So um, one of the things that simulation gives us is. Uh, is a way that we can find out um, whether the candidate is, um, you know, acceptable, or find out some things in terms of their communication skills, uh, situational awareness, in the simulation uh, before we, I guess, invest a lot of time and money um, in them. So, um, so when we look at doing one of our simulations um, for, for say, an air attack officer with uh, multiple aircraft. Um, on average, uh, if we were to look at the equivalent cost of flight and fuel time, uh, it's at least $33,000 equivalent uh, training cost. So on a season like 2019, which when, was one of our busiest uh, simulator seasons uh, prior to COVID, um, the equivalent cost of providing that training um, in the simulator versus how much it would cost us with real aircraft um, was close to 1.8 million dollars in equivalent cost so so when we're looking at you know sort of the cost savings um, uh, of doing simulator training it's it's pretty substantial and i think uh, currently we're we look at about 25 uh, percent of our uh, air attack officer simulation or sorry air attack officer training is now done in the simulator, and our goal is to get that up to about 50%. We realize that there still has to be real life flying in aircraft training done, but um, but I think with where we've come with our simulator, we can uh, greatly reduce uh, uh, that amount. And then, of course, as soon as you do that, you risk you reduce the risk of you know actual flying in aircraft, and actually reduce the the wear and tear on the aircraft as well. Um, so it, it also allows us to do recurrency training. So, you know, all 24 of our air attack officers do three to four sims uh, every spring prior to fire season. So um, they're much, much more prepared for fire season. It was interesting uh, this spring because of COVID, we weren't able to do sim training. And, uh, and I heard about it from uh, pretty much all of my air attack officers. They really missed that, uh, that uh, get the rest off training in the spring. So. And I think there's a there's a huge value to the role players that uh, that uh, are in the back room and and uh, flying the aircraft uh, as well. They get just as much value in uh, communication skills and um, being able to observe and work on uh, uh, the different fires and and see how others, uh, uh, whether it's a trainee or a uh, experienced air attack officer, do it. So. Um, another big benefit that we found is that it allows us to do uh, high risk, low frequency event training. So um, things that are very high risk in our jobs that don't happen very often. So um, our trainees don't, uh, our trainees or even our uh, certified air attack officers don't have that mental uh, model, I guess, or uh, of, of a certain event, things like searching for a downed aircraft or uh, we're doing a multi-fire lightning uh, event. Uh, managing that when you have five or six fires uh, happen in front of you. Um, so we can actually simulate uh, a lot of that um, for them and, and help, I guess, prepare them for when it really happens in, uh, in real life. And uh, it also allows us to test different standard operating procedures. So if we want to look at different ways of doing things, um, we can test them in the simulator. 
um, see how well they work, see what the challenges might be prior to uh, implementing them um, in the in the field. So uh, next slide, please. So some of the challenges, um, you know, that we faced, it's interesting because uh, uh, Scott and Nicole and I sir, are not simulator experts. We're not IT uh, gurus. We're all basically firefighters. So we've had to learn a lot along the way. Uh, we've had uh, had certainly had some help uh, from the outside, but we've done a lot of it ourselves as well. So, um, you know, certainly some of the challenges is just operational stability of the system. and you know, obviously with internet connections and things like that, uh, you know, you'll be in the middle of a simulation and all of a sudden it'll just freeze or, <laughs> um, so that's that's always been a, a, a challenge with us. Um, and just the ongoing sort of maintenance and development of the system, there's constantly uh, software updates, there's constantly uh, new things to be added, improved upon uh, throughout that and, and trying to keep up with the technology, I guess, is, is uh, is part of it as well uh, as is i guess sort of staffing and funding um you know i guess one thing that's really important to consider is um it's one thing to develop a simulator but then it's another thing to continuously keep it maintained and operating for many years to come so that has to be um, taken into account when looking at uh, staffing requirements for keeping it up and running as well and as just as important as funding um, you know to uh, you can't just fund it once it has to be maintained over years um, to keep it going and then just compatibility with uh, because there's so many different platforms and uh, other companies and users out there the the whole trying to I guess uh, develop uh, standard procedures and standard um, systems that they can all work together and talk together um, has, has been a challenge for us as well. Uh, next slide, please. And the future, uh, which is, I guess, the exciting part. Um, so, you know, I kind of mentioned that we basically do two months of sort of March and April is the core where we're doing our simulation work. But uh, for the most part, uh, our simulator isn't used um, very much outside of that that period. So I think part of our future is looking at other users of this, other agencies, other um, that you know can can come into uh, Hinton and and use this simulator, um, use the benefits of this tool. Um, I think potentially you know the fire growth models, uh, um, Lorby Wildfire Response has some very basic wildfire uh, growth models in it, uh, including like changing wind direction and speed. But, you know, there could be a future of uh, actually using the indices of a day uh, and uh, specific fuel types, I think that uh, you could actually create that in the simulator, which would be a, a big leap forward, I think. So, um, you know, and, and I guess the computer and software upgrades, it's uh, things like, uh, you know, it's interesting that Microsoft Flight Sim, um, you know, sold their whole flight simulator uh, program to Lo or to uh, Lockheed several years ago. And now they've uh, completely started uh, and upgraded, uh, um, you know, a, another uh, flight simulator program, which is, from what I've seen, is incredible. So there's always upgrades and, and uh, improvements that, uh, um, you know, in the system, and as well as the physical cockpit upgrades that uh, that are are happening, and uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty neat stuff that's going on around the world. Um, one thing that we, I guess, I would maybe recommend to anyone starting uh, into the sim world or uh, or progressing into the sim world is having the ability to record. Um, our system, we're able to record audio and video. Um, within the system, but currently can only be played within that system. So uh, I think the whole thought of developing CAN simulations for certain training purposes, um, and maybe more importantly, having um, the ability for a trainee after they finish their simulation to be handed a uh, memory stick so they can go to their computer and watch 
and listen to their simulation uh, afterwards, uh, I think has a lot of uh, good um, benefits for for learning uh, down the road. So we're not quite there yet with our system, but we're hoping, uh, you know, somewhere down the road that uh, we will be. And I think the big, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, I think that excites me the most is the, you know, that whole possibility of, um, you know, working with companies and other agencies, you know, that you could be, we could be flying our bird dog in Hinton and uh, um, Conair in Abbotsford, British Columbia will be uh, um, operating an air tanker and we can both talk to each other and work with each other um, on a fire together. And, and that, you know, could lead to that whole, I guess, national, international thought of, you know, things like sim weeks where, um, you know, we can, uh, we can work on uh, fires across the world, uh, work on um, some of those compatibility um, things that, uh, that sometimes we struggle with. So, so I think that's, uh, that's um, you know, the, the end goal or the big vision, I think, with, uh, with the simulator program. So, uh, okay, so maybe I'll go to the next slide and I'll just introduce our video that we're going to play. Um, so, <laughs> so one thing with this video, uh, please, um, this is certainly not a Steven Spielberg production. Uh, this was basically, uh, we met a few weeks ago in Hinton and this was basically shot with our iPhones and uh, kind of edited together, um, you know, what a simulation uh, might look like. So this is certainly not a professional production uh, by any means. Um, but it might give you a bit of an idea of uh, sort of the process uh, of what we go through with uh, when we're running a simulation. Uh, one thing to remember as well is uh, you'll notice that some of the video is a little bit grainy or pixelated and, and that's just because it's uh, basically filming um, a screen. Um, so in, in reality in the simulator, it's uh, uh, the, the sim environment is quite realistic. and. Uh, uh, so yeah, just take that uh, with a grain of salt, I guess. And I think we're okay to start the video. It's about 15 minutes, so enjoy. The next thing we're gonna do with Greg here is uh, we'll do a fire that's west of Calgary up near Canmore there. Uh, the detection number is gonna be BR04 and uh, the fire number will be CWF017. Um, essentially what we wanna do is set something up where we can sort of practice uh, basic tactics for Greg, uh, focus on airspace management, communications and, and tactics and topography. So this exercise is going to be doing for us. Um, for role players, we're going to be uh, simulating a work with group seven. So Greg will be in Bird Dog 132. Uh, so we'll need tanker 489, which is the Electra. And I think Bruce, you're going to be doing that one. Okay, so I'll be in uh, Yankee Alpha Alpha. Um, I'll be at 206 with Hack 1. I'll be at Dead Man's Flats. And Mike, I guess you're going to be uh, Papa Whiskey Tango 212 uh, with Fire Attack Crew 4, base at the Ghost. Okay. Um, for frequencies, we'll use the bomb channel be 122.92. Uh, the air attack or air advisory, sorry, will be 129.80. We'll use FireNet 119 and FireLine channel 32. Any questions? All right, Greg. Um, the next exercise we'll do here, uh, we're going to be working on some, in some topography here. So uh, we'll set you up as the air attack officer with Group 7, uh, the Spring Bank. You'll be in Bird Dog 132, and as part of your tanker group, it's uh, Tanker 489, which is the elector there. Um, any additional resource information we'll just provide you as part of the exercise, um, and that will be provided to the dispatcher. Um, weather and expected fire behavior, we'll, we'll consider it to be like a moderate high day. Um, consider it to be like an ISI of like 5 to 7, and a FWI in the high teens, low 20s sort of thing. So anticipating sort of moderate to high fire behavior. Um, the overall objectives we're trying to meet with this uh, exercise is to, is to again, focus on some basic tactics. Um, we want to see real emphasis on uh, clear airspace management principles and, and procedures there, uh, clear communications and, and strategies and tactics to be utilized in, in topographic features. So that's what this exercise will try to focus on for us. Okay, and then I just use my standard Palms for that area or anything? Yeah, okay, yeah. Normal. So whatever you find in the in the book there is, is what we'll go with. And, and uh, if there's any changes required, that'll be part of the exercise. Okay. okay. Any other 
questions? No? Okay, okay Greg, here's the dispatch information for the exercise. Okay, thanks. Switch on, camera closed and locked. Actually, panel test. Check us off swing bay on grid two detection in Bravo Road one zero zero four. We'll check on board. Okay, so we're going to be adding our fire to the landscape now. We've saved it as a scenario, so I'm going to load the scenario called Canmore. And I'm just going to load the script. So then our fire will show up over here, and you can see it on the landscape starting to develop here on the left. Can you go in uh, your number one eight thousand? Two nine nine two. Okay, so we'll plan on uh, doing a west to east runs, and we'll uh, you can arm one quarter and four. Okay, and uh, we'll shoot for blanketing action. Uh, and we'll favor the upslope uh, side of the park first. Quarter four, west to east, upside, side of the park. I'm trying to get 
tight one in, and then we'll do a done run for them. Okay. Speed up. Okay, uh, 489, what we have is uh, fire uh, in the valley. The valley's running uh, east-west. We are going to be doing a west-to-east run uh, on the upslope side. We can arm one quarter at four. So we're just doing a quick run, and then uh, we'll come around and give you a dummy run. Just check out the... Uh, Okay, 489, it's 132. Um, we just did a run there. We got a target elevation 5,300. If you have visual, I'm going to come around. We are at a crosswind break. Spring Bank too. For United, that's Bullseye Spring Bank in Spain. Yeah, you can check. We uh, ended up putting three loads, uh, three drops on uh, on fire 17. Uh, the fire is completely blanketed. Um, and popped right down. Don't anticipate any difficulties for the crew. And uh, we're just going to do the uh, fire and all clear. And then uh, spring back and stay unless you have other. Is 
Um, okay, so that exercise looked like it went pretty good. Um, we'll just do a, we'll do a, a review here, uh, just a little debrief on how the exercise went. Uh, just a quick sort of reminder that our, we were focusing on the, the basic tactics that were going to be employed there, the airspace management aspect of the, of the operation, uh, general communications and how that went, uh, as well as the strategies and tactics deployed and utilized in, in the topographic features that you guys were presented with. So, uh, maybe I'll just turn it to Greg there to sort of uh, talk about your impressions of how things went uh, with particular focus on, on those uh, objectives that we were doing. Yeah, so I think like uh, we had the dispatch information uh, correctly. Um, we had a, a bit of issues uh, with the GPS, but we did eventually sort that out um, en route. Um, so I think uh, we had good communications with uh, the helicopters, with the dispatch ground crews, uh, that all went well. Um, the the hell attack crew that was there did uh, uh, the assessment of the fire, but I think one thing I maybe forgot to do or didn't do was uh, provide a, um, a briefing or a, an assessment to dispatch just from a tanker perspective in terms of how many loads we're gonna need. Um, so they had to kind of prompt us. Hi, thank you. Thank you to Nicole, Scott and Greg for sharing with us the work that you've done and for that video as well. You might have said that you're not Spielberg, but don't sell yourself too short. That was really interesting. And I particularly liked with your program about how you've embedded that, that sort of fancy software into your training program and integrated it rather than it being it leading it. So thank you. Um, so Thanks to the audience for putting lots of questions into the Q&A. We'll go through those shortly. Uh, we'll probably run over time. For those of you that, that need to depart at 12, we will make sure that those questions and answers are sent out to you along with the screenshots, et cetera. So look after that. Um, so on that note, uh, I invite our three Canadian friends to answer your questions. And I may also introduce to you uh, Richard Alder, General Manager of NAFSI, to join our panel. So let's look at some of those top questions that have come through. So uh, thank you for your thumbs up too. It helps us decide which ones to use uh, and to, to focus on now. Um, one of the questions from Paul Baxter, thank you. Can the lobby wildfire response cater for different models of vegetation concentration, atmospheric humidity, land contours, etc., in addition to the wind speed and direction? Uh, not sure, perhaps, uh, Scott, are you able to assist with, with that question? Uh, yeah, I think I can try. Um, so it's, yeah, it's an excellent question. I think as it sits right now, the Lorby wildfire response does not um, sort of have that sort of refined ability to, to sort of read the landscape or read the vegetation types or anything of that nature. Uh, but like Greg mentioned, the, the potential of adding those features into the future is, is a real thing. Um, but as it sits right now, it does not. It, it does respond to the, the weather features that essentially are inherent in the prepared platform, uh, but doesn't really necessarily see the scenery objects that are in prepared as vegetation type changes or anything of that nature. Sure, thank you. Uh, has anyone else anything to add to that one as well? 
if that's okay. No, I think Scott covered it. Good, thank you. Uh, next question. How much would a system like this cost to set up? There's a lot of costs involved, but if you can give us an example of an example of I guess how the package, and if there are any tips about getting government support for investment. Um, Nicole, perhaps may I ask you? Yeah, certainly uh, I can start and, and the others could chime in. Um, because it's a developmental um, project we've undertaken, the costs are um, interesting to describe. I, I think originally we, we were in for about $120,000, $150,000 to purchase all the hardware, software, get the system set up. Um, on top of that, uh, thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a year of software costs is where we're sitting. So that's our kind of annual consumable. Uh, we've probably spent two or three times that if we looked at dedicated staff time and contractor support to try to confirm. Uh, so we bought a bunch of things, set it up, it was running, it wasn't perfect. Uh, so where should we get to? And it uh, turns out we were pretty, pretty aligned and uh, our, we do have techs and specs. We're more than willing to share with everybody about what our contractor has uh, set up as to a new system build that would be in around the $120,000 um, to set up from scratch. And, and Scott, did you have anything else that you wanted to add on that one? Yeah, I guess probably the only thing I would maybe add is, is that it is really is scalable. Um, so the, the system that we built for the cockpit is we went with a, a projector system and an outside the window screen system. So it has about a 200 degree field of view on a cylindrical screen. Um, there are options to go with uh, LCD flat panel displays to create that outside the window uh, visuals that you might be looking for. And if you wanted to sort of do it more cheaply, then less flat panel displays is maybe a way to save some costs. Um, the other thing that we've done is we did go with sort of a full uh, five role player setup that involves five different gaming computers and essentially 10 monitors and sort of all the infrastructure that goes along with that. Um, a less expensive system would potentially utilize less role player stations, but then potentially have the option of taking advantage of the network capabilities. And if you had sort of partner agencies or other uh, people you could utilize to be the role players, then maybe you don't have to have the capital costs of all the computer stations, but you can utilize sort of your neighbor's ability to have uh, role players uh, participate in your simulation. So, um, like Nicole mentioned is to sort of duplicate what we have is in the order of about 120 to 140 thousand uh, dollars, but there are sort of scale in uh, options that, that potentially could be a little less expensive than that. Sure, and um, I should mention, of course, to our audience that they'd be talking Canadian dollars, uh, so probably add a little bit extra to convert that to Australia. Um, in terms of um, of recommending that as an investment to our funding partners. I know, Greg, in your presentation, you talked about some of the cost benefits. Is that how you, I guess, sold it to them around the cost benefits being far, far outweighing the, the cost of setting it up? Yeah, I think that was a big, that was a part of the big selling feature when we do a business case for, you know, to get funding. Um, and Nicole did, uh, Nicole and Scott did a lot of uh, work towards obtaining federal funding. Um, but for sure, that helped with the buy in when we can show um, how much money you could potentially save with this avenue. Um, you know, it's, uh, it becomes a bit of a no brainer, I think, um, in terms of, you know, to train one air attack officer is $75,000. And, um, and takes two years and you know the whole system cost you know um, you know $120,000 so it doesn't take long before it's uh, um, you know the, its value is shown so. Sure thank you. Um, I would uh, just add to oh, um, so when you're looking at funding partners I guess I, I wouldn't put your blinders on we were um, pleasantly surprised that we actually received a million dollars in funding from uh, our, our defense program, our federal defense program, uh, because they have the mandate for public safety and security. And we were able to draw parallels, obviously, between wildfire suppression and response to public safety. So um, we have gotten a large chunk of funding from unsuspecting partners. That is very interesting. Thank you. As a business manager, I find that particularly interesting. Thanks. Uh, 
Thank you. Our next question from Peter Godfrey. Is there any simulator of this type currently in operation in Australia? I might send this one to Richard first off, um, and I'd be, NASI, the simulation group that we're working with, is looking at exactly this question. Yeah, thanks, um, Jason. Just take the opportunity to say thanks very much to Nicole, Scott, and Greg as well um, in front of the audience for their um, fantastic presentation, and I endorse the Spielberg comments as well. That was great. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so it, look, the, the short answer is uh, that there is some um, basic sets setups in Australia, I guess, along the same, same lines, but not quite as advanced. And there's, there's in fact, a couple of mobile setups in trailers um, that, that can be taken out to the field. Obviously not quite as sort of sophisticated, but I think in some cases using the same underlying um, software. And uh, the state of New South Wales has also commissioned a system to be um, built, and I think probably quite similar in, in approach to the Alberta system. Um, and that is expected to be um, un underway in the next uh, next couple of months, as I understand it. Um, and I think uh, our state of Queensland is also working on commissioning a system that's not dissimilar. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind too is that there are a number of um, simulators around Australia that were probably de um, designed primarily as pilot training simulators, but could be quite easily adapted, you know, to this sort of um, this sort of approach, um, retaining the, you know, the, the, the pilot simulation and all the, the, the technical specs that go with that, but yeah, it could quite easily be adapted, I think, to these sorts of um, things, and, you know, existing commercial simulators potentially. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. Yeah. Thanks, Jase. Thank you. Uh, our Canadian friends, did you have anything to add to that, especially around, did you look at um, adapting simulators that were already in existence? in the way that Richard just mentioned. Yeah, I guess we started this program. Uh, British Columbia had um, had built a simulator. Um, actually, a, a fellow named Sean Lund had built uh, a simulator basically in his garage. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so Scott and I went uh, down to, uh, at the very start of this project, uh, started to, you know, we went down to, to have a look at it and and see, you know, what its capabilities were, and that that basically started as down the road to where we're at right now. So, um, and then some of the companies, uh, air tanker companies, especially, have uh, some simulators um, as well that they use for their pilot training in uh, Canada. So we we did have a look at some of those uh, when we first started the project. So. Thank you. Right now. Um some of the federal funding we have is to look at compatibility with industry simulators and and is there that way to network or port into um, a, the same virtual simulation environment and uh, on our slide where we talked about uh, capabilities uh, challenges with um, uh, compatibility between software that's certainly where we're seeing some um, some limitations to to network and port in uh, obviously when you're training pilots you're um, level of simulator compliance with uh, federal regulations is, is very different than training uh, the person sitting beside a pilot. Good, thank you. Uh, next question from Paul Symington. How many instructors and role players are required to conduct a simulation for a trainee? Greg, you covered that a little in your presentation. Could you elaborate? Yeah, it, it depends on the, how complex the simulation is, but typically we'll use a group of about eight uh, personnel. Uh, so that includes the trainee, the trainer, uh, four to five role players. And uh, we do the role playing work is not just flying aircraft. Uh, we do role playing of ground crews on radios. We do role playing of dispatchers. Um, and fire centers, I guess, uh, and then the, the simulation director. So a typical, um, I guess, call it one of our advanced uh, air attack simulations, uh, there will usually be about eight people involved uh, at that time. I, I might, maybe I'll just I'll add in just a little bit there that, um, again, it's another one of those things that's kind of scalable, that there are sort of the critical uh, role players that are required, and, and that would essentially be your uh, bird dog pilot, and then maybe one or two other role players who play various roles on the on the radio that the air attack officer would interact with. So, um, depend like Greg said it exactly right. Is depending on the complexity that you're looking for, 
uh, you do have the ability to sort of scale that up or down. Very good, thank you. Uh, next question from Paul Baxter. Thank you, Paul. Can you map the terrain database to real world areas or just generic terrain models? Um, perhaps uh, Scott? Yes, Scott yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the, the prepared software does come with sort of the real world terrain. Um, the scenery package that comes along with the, the prepared system, I guess, is reasonably generic and maybe not super helpful, but we've had some, some real success by using some add-on scenery software like uh, Orbex is, is one that sort of puts out a, a, an enhanced scenery package that doesn't quite hit photorealism, but uh, does really sort of enhance the immersive uh, environment that people operate in. So uh, I guess that's the long way of saying it is geographically real in that the, the places that you see are, uh, are the real thing. And so it gets to the point where uh, our trainees can navigate by map and by looking out the, the window of the simulation and, and the, the land features that they see are for real. Um, but the additional software, the additional scenery packages really does enhance the realism because there are limitations to the, um, I guess, the fidelity that prepared uh, offers with regards to scenery. And I might add to that, that uh, Lorby uh, Wildfire Response has some, some scenery, easy add-on scenery as part of the, the, the package. So you can add like fire trucks and ground crews and um, so uh, in the, into a scenario at any time. I think you might have seen in the video, there's some firefighters with hoses uh, there. So you can add some of those um, features, uh, the director from the director station instantly into the scenario as well. And, and maybe I'll add, it's, a, it's such a good point that, uh, like Greg mentioned, the, the high risk, low frequency events, we can use some of those scenery effects to create uh, fires in and around, uh, let's say, towers or power lines or things of that nature, that if we want to try and uh, sort of create a more uh, complicated scenario than, say, the, uh, the simulated landscape offers, we can add those features in as well. Very good. We'll probably need to add kangaroos and koalas to any of yours <laughs> as well. <laughs> uh, next question from Jim Blackmore. How long do the simulations generally last? I'll take that to mean the the video or the training sessions at any time. Uh, Jim, if that's not what you meant to, let us know and we'll try and follow up on that. Um, and Nicole, may I ask you uh, how long your training sessions in the simulations tend to last? Yeah, uh, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think around an hour, an hour and a half uh, for, the, for the more uh, complicated ones. Yep. Yeah, usually we try to do everything in real time as much as we can, especially en route to the fire. The only time we might speed things up a little bit is coming back from the fire. We still want to make sure that we do go over like landing procedures, especially for a trainee, like making sure the gear is down and those, you know, those standard operating procedures. But on typically longer dispatches, we may kind of, we have the ability to kind of warp ahead a little bit, um, you know, uh, kind of on the way home. Um, but generally we, we do real time and uh, yeah, it's usually about an hour to an hour and a half per simulation. Thank you. Uh, a couple of observations here I'll just read out from John, John Katz. Victoria is currently trialing this system in a smaller scale based in the Fox trailer design, allowing us to take the sim to the student. student. Well, actually, I wonder if the um, Fox trailer design, is that familiar to, to any of you? Something that you do? Possibly not, that's okay. Uh, next question from Peter Hayes. Does the fire growth in Lorby fire include a random or stochastic, stochastic element? Sorry for my pronunciation. Again, that, that one doesn't do that. Uh, not really, I guess is maybe the way to say it is it's a real simplified fire growth model that, that uh, has been sort of overlaid into the prepared world. Um, with that in mind, it does, um, I guess the stochastic piece is, is it, it probably makes sense in computer language and computer in computer land. To us, it sometimes looks like um, a series of pixels that weren't on fire will all of a sudden be on fire. So sometimes it does look like it jumps ahead or moves in, in sort of a, um, an unusual or random sort of feature. 
or, or effect, but um, I think for the most part, it's, it's safe to say that it, it's not, if it is uh, sort of random growth or stochastic growth, then uh, it's probably more by accident than anything. Yeah, and there is a, a feature in the director station where you can uh, set, you, you can ch change some of the settings in terms of how uh, the fire will affect the next pixel over, I guess they call it. Um, so whether if you want a, a slow moving fire versus a, a fast moving fire. Um, so that is a little bit built into it. Um, you know, and also if you, you know, if you do turn the wind up in a certain direction, it will, the fire will increase uh, somewhat growth in that direction. The column will actually lean over. Um, but like Scott mentioned, it's very rudimentary. It's not following any, you know, um, fire uh, growth models or anything like that. Thank you. Uh, another question here, can you see the suppression simulation being utilized for scenario planning for ground resources as well? Do you, uh, I know that you're an aerial firefighting specialist, do you have queries about the processes you use from your ground support colleagues? Uh, maybe Scott can uh, maybe answer that one best. Um, yeah, I guess I can try. Is that uh, as it sits right now, we haven't really explored the opportunity to, to um, sort of simulate ground firefighting in this uh, on this platform. Um, our software developer uh, from Lorby, Lorby Wildfire Response seems to indicate that that would be um, a doable thing where we'd be able to deploy say heavy equipment or fire crews and then the, the suppression action um, that those resources employ would impact the, the fire spread and fire growth. But um, quite honestly, we haven't really explored that option yet. But again, software developers will tell you that anything's doable for a price. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's, that's all we'll have time for now. As I mentioned, we'll, the unanswered questions will forward to our our Canadian friends and, and send those off to you. Um, I would like again to thank Nicole, Scott and Greg for making time to speak with us this evening for them. It certainly provided us with a lot to think about. Uh, on behalf of NASI and AFAC, may I also thank you in the audience for joining us today and for your evident interest in using simulation. Uh, I think that's great. As, as you know, NASI is coordinating a group to to um, develop that within the Australian context. So thank you very much for your interest on that. Our events team will be sending you a short survey by email. We'll use this information to ensure our professional development events program continues to meet your needs. I also wanted to thank the events team, in particular, Nicola Lawrence and Greg Taylor in particular for their preparation for this event and for their comforting diligence with Zoom. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to host you today. Until next time, stay safe, stay distant and together, and stay cool. Goodbye.